kids, welcome to episode 251 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 17th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. 2023 is winding down, and I wanted to put a few things out there for listeners to consider. January and February are terrific times for me to record content. Winters in Michigan can be unforgiving, and I am happy to stay indoors, by my fireplace, and work on the upcoming episodes. I've promised two crowdsourced episodes. In January, I'll be asking listeners to call in with the hills they'll die on. And in February, I'll ask listeners to call in with purchases they regret. With both of these episodes, I'd like to try something new. Listeners are going to be invited to email me a voice recording. So put your thinking caps on and consider what you would answer to these two questions. This is hopefully a fun and casual opportunity for everyone to share and be a part of the podcast. So stay tuned, details to follow. I'd also like to invite those listeners who have not been featured on the podcast yet to consider making that a goal for 2024. We all have something to share. Take a look at the link at the FAQs in the show notes. I think it's worth mentioning that just because I've recorded a topic once doesn't mean we can't revisit it. And remember, season one was an entirely solo effort, and season two was four years ago. This show remains relevant because each episode showcases the amazing and inspiring work we do every day in our libraries. I hope you will give it some thought. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Ashley in Arkansas, Holly in Georgia, and Amanda in Texas. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at LMS underscore United. On threads, you can find me at School Librarians United and on Blue Sky at SLU Podcast or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Be sure to listen to episode 224. I announce a sponsorship with Literati Book Fairs, and now a chance to hear from one of Literati's team members, Aubrey. Hey, Aubrey. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Amy. Thanks. Happy to be back. So, Aubrey, remind listeners, what is your job at Literati? Of course. I am the curator, so I get to choose all the lovely books that you see at the fair and in our boxes. You know, Aubrey, I I think that when I think about the book fair, and I I remember families coming, and I'm very aware that that they put a lot of thought into the books that they want to buy because they are adding books to their home libraries. And and I I know as a parent whose kid was shopping at a book fair, and and as as somebody who, who regularly attended them, I was always concerned that what I was purchasing was going to last, not just through my first kid reading it, but my second kid reading it and my third kid reading it. So what does Literati do to ensure that when our our shoppers are coming through the book fair, that the product that they're buying is going to be well-made and something that will will really stand the test of time in a home library? Yeah, of course, Amy. Um Literati makes sure that all of the books that we curate and feature at our fairs are of the highest quality. And that doesn't just mean great stories, which they are. Um, we reach out to over, we work with over 150 publishers um, and curate a diverse array of stories. But we also make sure that those books themselves, the physical books, are really well made. These are not books that will fall apart on you. They're the exact same quality you would get um, on the shelf at your local Barnes & Noble, your local indie. You know, really nice paper, really good binding, strong binding. So we're not, you know, bringing in anything that will fall apart. You can definitely share it with multiple children in your household. Um, But we also really want to make sure that we bring in a range of prices, which we do. So any kid with any budget can, you know, walk away with something that they really love at a literary book fair. 
Oh, I'm. I, it's a relief because, you know, as the person signing up for the book fair, I want to make sure that my families are, you know, they enjoy, not just enjoy being there, but enjoy the books for years to come when they take those books home and they're able to enjoy them with all their kids. So, Aubrey, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Of course. Happy to be here. Thanks, Amy. Friends, be sure to tune in to learn all about Literati and their very generous offer. Librarians who book their very first Literati Book Fair for this school year and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the Literati team today to see if you qualify. And now a word from our sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning PebbleGo Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. I'm also grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 6. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, Respecting Our Littles, and my conversation with Amanda McCoy. Amanda McCoy, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Again, I'm just so honored to be here. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, You are finding this out uh, right now. Um, your episode 175, Storytime Strategies, is the second most popular, most downloaded podcast that we've had in the entire six years of the show. You've been downloaded in all 50 states, uh, in 52 countries, including Bahrain, Fiji, and Malta. Uh, so that's fantastic. I Truly, your expertise has reached around the world. Would you give us, uh, just give us a little idea, what are some Storytime Strategies which have been especially successful with your students recently. Oh, absolutely. We just instituted one that happens right before our lesson, actually. Our library doesn't have a traditional uh, slot in the counter, book return. So I've been struggling, like, when kids come in, where should I put my books, Mrs. McCoy? Well, uh, um, I mean, I guess here, because that's where I'm going to scan them in. I mean, sure. So we had this very plain filing cabinet next to the checkout computer, and I looked at it and looked at it and I said, you know what? It would be awesome if they just stacked them on top of this. Hmm, how am I going to facilitate that? You know what? I can get some spray paint, a couple of vinyl dots, and we now have the book return spot. And we rolled it out with a video and there's dots on the floor. I had a colleague who heard me brainstorming and was like, oh, what if you put dots on the floor? And we made a rhyme that said, follow the dots to the book return spot. So now we say it as we walk to it, we return our books. It's wonderful. Oh, that's so cute. But I mean, again, you know, and I I love that you've had to come up with something. And the fact is, this isn't a procedure you've been doing year after year. And you're not new to this space, but you've had to come up with a solution. And it's not the beginning of the year. We're kind of into the year for, I mean, you've been back to school for a while now. So, but the kids are going to be okay because you're celebrating this new procedure that you're implementing. Absolutely. I introduced as a new piece of furniture and they're all looking around like sideways, backwards, like, trying to find it. So they, they they embraced it. It's been great to see them just dive right in and be like, okay, this is how we do this now. Great. Well, and anybody who's ever taught littles knows that there's going to be that one kid who thinks they're doing you a favor by putting their book back where they found it on the shelf. Oh, one is, um, one is hopeful. Uh, usually I, I feel like it's a handful, but I mean, we're, we're getting there. If you can be so explicit and just say, this is exactly what we do. Not, not vague, like, eh, just kind of over there, you know, we are trying to be as explicit as possible. Mrs. McCoy does not need the help of, of putting it back on the shelf. Although I appreciate your helpful spirit. That is so kind. 
Yes. For those of us of a certain age, remember free to be you and me. Some kind of help is the kind of help that helping's all about. And some kind of help is the kind of help we all could do without. Um, when they start shelving their their books that haven't been checked back in, you're like, dude, <laughs> you're wonder. I, I do truly, I had a little bring bring their parent back to the library and say, Mrs. Herman, I told my mom I brought the book back. I'm like, sweetie, where did you put it? Back on the shelf. I was like, okay, let's go find it. <laughs> They're like, that's adorable. That's really cute. Yeah. Yeah. So Amanda, I am so grateful you're here today because you presented a fantastic session at AASL 23 in Tampa just light, late, you know, last month, not long ago. But for the vast majority of our listening audience, they didn't get to go to this conference. And yet you're here to sort of recreate this amazing session that you gave to the people who are at the conference. Would you give us some insight as to what motivated you to generate this particular presentation for this conference? Absolutely. I have been to a couple previous AESLs and I was noticing uh, there weren't as many presentations on primary students as I was hoping for. Um, I really wanted some more insight on on how to help them have the best library experience possible. So I started brainstorming ideas and and thought, what can what do I have that I can bring to the table? What are the things that I am passionate about when we're talking about littles? And I feel like I, I pulled like every trick in my bag of tricks and kind of put it in this presentation that hopefully will help people um, who want to do better for their young students. Well, I think ideally we would all get a tour of your space and we'd get to shadow you for a day because I'm thinking that that would be the best way to learn uh, all of the expertise that you bring to this particular age group. You know, the visuals you provided in your slide deck are incredibly compelling. I hope that listeners get an opportunity to examine those specific images that you've chosen to demonstrate these concepts in your library space, the designs and the signage that you've used. Some of these things that you've done seem subtle, but some of the things you've done have absolutely transformed the space that your students work in. Yes, absolutely. And uh, as a bonus, if you if you choose to engage with me on social media, um, I'm in a new library just this fall and I'm implementing so very many of these things that I know to be good practice in this new space and seeing so many different things that need to be changed. And I'm trying my best to document and document and document those <laughs> and share that journey with everyone. A picture is worth a thousand words. And when you're a librarian looking at the work that another librarian does, like we can actually figure out all the work that went into it too. I think non-librarians are like, oh, that's so nice. And you're like, nope, that represents a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. There's one picture and you know the 10 different projects that went into making that picture. And someone, you know, who doesn't share our profession might just look at it very simply. Absolutely. The message that I get when I look at, at your uh, presentation is that we have to design our spaces not for our older students or, or students who are going to be older in, in a few years and they're just, it's just about, you know, them maturing into this space, but rather providing the space that our littles can benefit from immediately when they walk in. This is a space which has been created with them in mind. And you use this phrase I absolutely love, fully human today. I am so very passionate about the fact that our primary students are fully human today. They walk in and they might not be at the same developmental level as our older students, but they are still people. They have hopes and dreams and they have books that they like to read. They have topics that they're interested in learning about. And we need to respect those just as much as we do our older students. We don't need to have a space that that waits for them to get older or leaves them behind. It really, really takes their needs and their desires into account in our library space today that they are experiencing. Well, and I, I love that because, you know, as somebody who's had the benefit of working with older students now, I appreciate that that kind of joy uh, when they come in and they do have agendas. You can tell these littles, they have been thinking about this trip to the library all week since the last time they're in the library and, and they're there and you've got to find a way to really channel that energy in a way that really does, you know, lend itself to all the amazing things that your space can provide for these students in the way of building that love of reading. 
you know, in addition to supporting our littles and our pre-K through second grade. So friends, it's approximately like ages three through seven years old. You also include other school populations, other student groups who would directly benefit from the recommended modifications that you've suggested in this session. So I'm hoping you can expand on that because I think this is where we can all of a sudden justify this for so many reasons beyond addressing uh, our, our young, our youngest patrons. You bet. I, I believe that English language learners can really benefit from a lot of the things that we're talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of different visuals, a lot of simple, very clear, um, consistent language. Uh, students receiving special education services can absolutely benefit from these things. And then students that are new to our school also. If we make sure that our space is laid out and signed in such a way that it makes sense to a person walking in for the first time, um, that's also going to help those students that walk in and are new to the school. And it's going to help our primary students at the same time. Every time I've, I've worked with little little our, our littles, I've also noticed that our neurodivergent students uh, are ones who really do, this space is one that, that really does speak to their need for consistency and predictability. And there's a lot of ownership that happens when students walk into their library and they know, they feel empowered that they can find things that they, that they love. And I've noticed that when I've gone and participated in IEPs, I've noticed that a lot of my neurodivergent students Really, when it, they come to the library space, this is a space that they can count on and they can ha then their routines work well within this space. And, and I always feel good because when I talk to their, their special education teachers, they're like, oh, they love library. You know, library is, library is not, the, not the issue. The issue is, you know, fill in the blank, you know. <laughs> so, you know, you want to make sure that you're supporting all your students, but it seems like a lot of this best practice you know, works its way into other student populations. It's so great to watch that happen as you see those students come in and, like you said, feel very empowered. They have autonomy in the space. They know what to do. They know where things are. They know that it's a place that they can explore and discover different things related to the topics that they are super into that day, that week, that month, that year or two. Well, and, you know, anybody who's had the pleasure of working with our youngest patrons knows that they're very uh, task oriented uh, and they, they do love to flex the skills that they have in that space. And it is not unusual for you to get a whole bunch of helpers who want to show other kids where to find the books because they know. It is the best to watch them, to watch them share that knowledge. They feel so wonderful that they know these things and they want to share it with the world. Well, and what I'm really hoping right now is we've got some of those high school teachers and some of those middle school teachers who are listening right now because there is a possibility sometime in their career, if you're in this long enough, that you may find yourself with that K-12 certification. <laughs> you may find yourself either having the opportunity to move into an elementary position or you may find because of circumstance, this is where you are. And all the different reasons that we can celebrate this particular age group in our library spaces. So I, I, you're one of these people who, if I could put you on a little platform and say, hey, friends, this is a person you need to learn from when it comes to working with our littles. You're <laughs> absolutely like the energy is contagious. You know, you've taken this whole concept, you've broken down your presentation into sight, sound, and touch. And if you could, like, when you look at at organizing all these different ideas. Why did you, you do it in this particular way? So it, if you've interacted with primary students at all, you know they very much take in their surroundings through these senses. I did leave out taste and smell. While those are going to happen in the library, that's not really something we, we hope for ever. <laughs> so we'll try to avoid that whenever possible. But but sight is a big one. They come in and, and will start telling you and talking about things that they see right away. Um, we need to be very intentional with the sounds that the students are hearing, talking about um, a population that really latches on when we say something. So we want to make sure that we are being very intentional with the words that we choose to, to, that we choose to use. And then touch. I'm, I'm talking more about the, the student voice that the kids get to have. 
that they get to exert their voice on our spaces. Let's dive in because I know listeners want to learn all your trade secrets about how to just transform not only our program, but our space and our practice and how we engage with our space and our students and make this a a more rewarding experience, both for our littlest patrons and for the librarian who's in there working with them day in and day out. So let's start off with shelving, because this seems like the biggest part of, 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 this seems like a very big undertaking because your collection is big uh, and you, it involves moving a lot of things physically. So can you give us an idea of how shelving needs to be oriented in order to support our littlest patrons? Yes, and you are absolutely right. It can be a very expensive thing, but there are so many things that we can do to improve the shelving for our primary students that don't cost anything except a little elbow grease, like you said. So the first thing that I really look at is is the height, the height of our shelves. I took a picture in my new space and was super excited. I have all these books out. It looks so attractive for first day of school. And I looked down and noticed that my bottom row of shelves had a like a two, three inch gap at the bottom, like the the bottom shelf was set up when it didn't need to be. And while for our older students, that's not a very big deal, that two to three inches could make a huge difference to a primary student who is hopping on our one of our kick steps and trying to reach for the tallest book that they possibly can. It could be the difference between the kid being able to reach for the book and grab it themselves or needing to ask for help, which they don't want to do. They want to get it themselves. So thinking about the things that you can adjust first when you're looking at your shelving is a great place to start. Um, I also recommend looking at the orientation in your library, where your sections are located. Personally, I really like to teach in the everybody section. If at all possible, you have those picture books out and proud for the kids to to see. And if they're kind of zoning out during your lesson, at the very least, they're looking at like hopefully what they want to check out that day. Now, in my current space, that's not possible. And that's fine. Um, You can think about if You have shelves that are accessible. I'm talking very much about your high traffic topics. Uh, The one of the libraries that I was in had spiders, sharks, snakes, and big cats in one corner of the bookshelves. And every time we let kindergarten or first grade go for checkout, it was a hot mess. Just kids pushing and shoving to get the cheetah book. Like it was, oh my goodness, it was, it was a wreck. So when we genre fight, I made sure to pull those apart so they were on a wall and much more accessible for a number of students at that time. So let me ask you, did you also genreify your nonfiction? I did at that at that school. Um, I'll, I, I'll be doing something at this school. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But yes, <laughs> I did genreify the nonfiction as well. Wow. Fantastic. Well, and you know, I think we have to, it doesn't take long to figure out these patterns of the, of the students when they're, I, you know, comparing us to like anthropologists and watching the, the, the movement of the humans, watching the movement and, and making sure that we are not creating obstacles in their, in their path to get to what they need to go to. And, you know, I, they're such creatures of habit. It doesn't take long to change those patterns, but you do want to make sure that you're, you're always helping them. I love this idea that you're move, making your collection bottom heavy. That you And I, I will say, I know that I've worn out the knees in a lot of my slacks because I'm kneeling on the ground. And you can always tell because I, I've been shelving things on the lowest shelf. But there's a reason because those are the shelves the kids can reach. Yes. I have a pro tip for that, by the way. A, um, a clerk that I had said, hey, at this previous library, we had a mechanics stool um, that has wheels on the bottom and you sit really low on it and it's really easy to wheel yourself around and if you have a short cart it really works well too it's I mean it's a an expenditure that you have to make but man if you have a person that you're asking to um, shelve things or if you are shelving things on the bottom shelf it can be really worth it in my previous library we really heavily heavily weeded the everybody section one year because I was really passionate about getting a the largest number of face outs that possibly could turning as many books as I could face out as possible. People spend days, weeks, months working on those book covers. We need to show those out and loud and proud because that's what attracts the kids to the books. So we took that heavily weeded section 
moved everything we could to the bottom two rows. And then we had three rows above, two rows above, just solely for face outs. It's just a sea of face outs. And I, I love the way that it turned out. Well, and you'll see, friends, when you look in Amanda's presentation, like the before and after is absolutely telling of, of what has happened to your shelves. You know, this idea of dynamic shelving. And I, I know when I uh, was working with my little, something that I would do is I would just stand up books on top of the bookshelves. And my assistant hated it because all the kids, they, they'd knock them over like dominoes. And I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter. We're just going to put the back, books back up. And you know what? That is what we're going to do because the students need to be able to see because the likelihood is that they can't read necessarily read the spines. So I do have to ask you, what do you do, because I was struggling, with your oversized books? Because I know with, especially with picture books, there are always going to be these books that do not fit the standard. I mean, they, they just are oversized. And my problem is if you turn them on, on their sides, you can't see the the spine, all you're seeing is the bottom of the book, usually. You know, how do you deal with your oversized books in your collection? Because they're beautiful books, but they don't fit on the standard shelf. I, I will say for the most part, because they don't fit, they're extra popular. So they tend to check out quite a bit. So I put them on display a ton. Um, another ASL presentation uh, that Tom Bober um, was part of, he has an oversized section and just puts them all in one section that has kind of a different type of shelf. And you can adjust the height of your shelves to accommodate. Like these are all the really big books. We keep them all in this one place. And it's even noted in the catalog that way. Well, and it makes me remember about the um, the large print. If you go to the public library and the, and the public library oftentimes does a second section and it's the large print books because they are physically going to oftentimes be a different size. No, that makes a great deal of sense. I really love dynamic shelving too. I think that it has a very similar philosophy to bottom heavy shelving. I, I tend to think of bottom heavy shelving as like the perfect solution for primary students because there are so many face outs and also because it is so easy to refill. You just put the books that are on the bottom two shelves above. You can have kids refill those very, very easily. And if you go looking for a book in the catalog, it's going to be straight above. It's not a huge departure from where it would have been anyway. But it's so easy to keep a constant stream of those going back up because your circulation in those picture books is super high and you want to be able to throw something back up pretty quickly and replicate that display again. This sounds terrible, but sometimes when I was shelving, I would take the books that I was, and you want to make sure that you're always refreshing your displays, but it is so easy to just take some of those books off that that cart that you've just, all those books you just checked back in and just put them right back up on the display. <laughs> They're popular anyway. Why not? No, go for it. Exactly. No, I have to tell you, I was always guilty of taking the books that have been checked back in and taking that cart and putting it right back out in the middle where the students could pick off of them. Because I, I got to be honest, more than half of the books found their way. Like, I didn't have to shelve more than half of our books because the kids had wanted the book that their friend had. Well, Mrs. Herman, I read my, my friend had that book and I want that book. Oh, it's on the cart. Go get it. And so, you know, it's, it's imprecise because it's not shelved accurately. It's just going to go back and onto the shelves. But on the other hand, you don't have to shelve it again. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, it's just going to go straight back out. Like if you introduce that cart is like the hot popular titles. Absolutely. Got kids over there in a hurry. Work smarter, not harder. So let me ask you about your displays. Um, and how did you plan these to make sure to support your littlest patrons? Sure. So I also with uh, always, that is, with every single display that we do, I make sure that there, there is a diversity of authors and illustrators represented not just with our beginning of the year, not just during Black History Month. Obviously, we're doing it every single um, opportunity that we have, that we have a display up. We're checking for a diversity of authors and illustrators. We really need to monitor that throughout the year. Um, I also make sure, since we're doing primary students, that there is an adequate number of books. You could have one first grade class come in and demolish your display if there's only 10 books in it. Um, so I try to pick things that we have enough of those books that we give multiple classes a chance to interact and grab books from the display, making sure that we give everyone a chance to get in on the action. 
And then I really think about um, how my kids are going to know that they can um, check out those books because that's a very frequent question for a primary student. Oh, this looks very pretty. Like uh, there are other times I know I'm not supposed to touch these things. So Mrs. McCoy, can I check this book out? Yes, of course. You can check this book out. You can see the book. You can check it out here. Like it doesn't work like that. We're not a, a pretty store full of China. Please take everything. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, a collection created for littles is going to have different priorities than a collection for our middle grade or our high school students. I have come to appreciate this firsthand. You know, for somebody who has not worked in a, a collection designed for littles, a, a primary collection, give us an idea of where your priorities are because of the population you're supporting. I really, when I'm thinking about picture books, I will look a lot at the number of picture books and more often than not, you have too many. There are too many on the shelves. There are things cluttering the shelf that are in the way of your kids seeing the good stuff that you have. So uh, I make sure that we have a, a number that serves our students, but isn't cluttered with things that aren't getting checked out. Uh, obviously, I'm looking at the age and the relevance of those titles and making sure that I have a wide diversity of picture books that I can make displays at all times that are representing not only our kids, but kids that our students might not know yet from around the world. First of all, I will say one thing about our picture books. They can oftentimes be um, dated because of the nostalgia, the nostalgia feature. And and I, I remember being absolutely like crushed when I pulled bread and jam for Francis off the shelf and I took it home for myself because you know what? That was one of the first books I remember my mom reading to me and thinking, you know what? It's okay. Like, it's going to be okay. But when you realize that this is one of the things that I, I, I think I recorded this in, in extreme weeding, extreme weeding, when you have to realize that nostalgia cannot be keeping you from, from doing an adequate job of weeding your picture books. And we've, I, my, my goodness, I, we had Babar on the shelf. We, we owe it to our students to, to make sure that we, we do put aside our nostalgia uh, for, for the books that were read to us as children. Um, it's brutal. It's hard. When we're looking at, at nonfiction books, uh, number is another thing to look at. Depending on the section, you might have too many, you might have too few. If you keep getting the same question over and over again and your constant response has to be, sorry, they're all checked out. Sorry, they're all checked out. Sorry, they're all checked out. You need more of that book. Maybe it's lions. Maybe it's robots. Maybe it's butterflies. But whatever you're getting the request for that you have to keep saying isn't there. That's what you know you need to get next. Um, I look at the age um, of those nonfiction books uh, and the reading level is a huge one. Um, I had a... A book, I, had a, I had a request for a cheetah book, like my first day or two on this at this new school. And I'm like, okay, let's walk over to Big Cats. And they're right over there. Oh, darn it. There's no cheetah books on the shelf. So I pull up my um, Destiny on my iPad. And okay, there's what? That's weird. There's one cheetah book at this school. Okay. I mean, maybe they got lost at the end of last school year. I don't know. But that's unacceptable. So we're going to put that on a new book order. And then I looked a little closer at the at the one cheetah book that we had, and it was copyright 1989 and a fifth grade reading level. And I happen to know the series, and it's a lot more text than pictures. Even if that shelf that would have been on the shelf, it was not going to be attractive to that little kid that was looking for a cheetah book. So we need to make sure that we have books that have tons of wonderful, beautiful, engaging pictures and text that those kids can read in the nonfiction section. One of the easiest things I did was to make sure that, and and I'm dating myself. But if the pictures in the books were black and white, the picture, like the pic, those nonfiction books were gone, like done. We are done. If the pictures were black and white and, and, you know, or illustrated, it, you, you've got, you've got a, a series on whales or a series on, you know, uh, you know, aquatic mammals, you know, and they're, and they're illustrated. Oof. That's, that's going to be, that's going to be hard. And um, I do notice, especially with my, my littles, that they, they love series books, by which I mean, like, if you're buying the gem book, 
by all the gem books, you know, if you can swing it, you know, because they read, they read one of them in the series and then they can see the pattern of the page and go, oh, I read the emerald one. Now I'm going to read the one on rubies and then I'm going to read the one on diamonds. And, that, and I don't know why gems were a real big thing when I was an elementary librarian, but they wanted the whole series. And can we have all of the books? And I was like, yep, we can. And then you put them all out in that display and they just sell themselves. It's, it, it's wonderful. So, you know, let's go ahead and I want to ask you about signage. Because our, many of these students are pre-readers or they're right on the cusp. They're getting, uh, they're starting to, to figure things out, but they still rely very heavily on images. And this is where your presentation does this amazing job of just showing a simple thing uh, when you look at the signs that you provide to your students. So can you give us an idea of what goes into your planning when you create signage for your littles? Sure. When I think about signage for a primary student, I'm really thinking about uh, the amount of pictures versus text first. You can have both on one sign that can serve both of those audiences. But when you have a sign that's only text, you have automatically made it inaccessible to some of our students. And when the option is right there to have the pictures and the text, that's really, really important. I think about the clarity of the, both the pictures and the text. Um, if you are perhaps advertising the nonfiction gorillas, could you, instead of having a super cutesy clip art version of a gorilla that could be mistaken for something else, maybe get a real picture? Like that would, would serve your students so much better. There are so many wonderful free images available online now that we can do better now. We, we have options. Well, and if you do the transparent image, so if you get the actual picture, it almost looks like a DK, uh, like a DK eyewitness sign, because, it, it, you know, when you've got cats and dogs, instead of using a clip art image, using an actual, you know, full color image, but remove that background and put it next to the, you know, the 636.7, 636.8, and you've got those those uh, very vibrant uh, photos of the of the uh, animals in this case, it does make a big difference because the clip art is a little too bubbly and it looks very sort of, I don't know. It really is. Is that a leopard? Is it a cheetah? Is it? It's not a specific animal with spots. Like it's not. It's it's not specific enough. No, absolutely. Now, and I also have to I, let's talk about fonts because in in <laughs> it's really easy to like lose a lot of time trying to dwell on the type of font you should use. You should be consistent. But for gosh sakes, look at the letter A, look at the letter G, and the look at the letter T. And you'll know what I'm saying if you've ever written out these and the kids look at them, they don't know what it is. And I tried to figure out what this is when the A has the, the curve over the top or the G has the two bubbles, not just one, but two, or the T has the, it looks like a, a backwards J. And the kids are like, what is What's it? Why that? does it curve at the bottom? <laughs> like, yes. And this is my hill. This is my hill, Amy. Uh, I, I love cursive, beautiful fonts. They are lovely in so many places, but they have no place in a space where primary students are expected to read the words. They just, they just don't belong there. I think we can do so much better. I am a huge fan of a font called Lexendeca. It was scientifically created to be easy to read on, on eyes. It has, it has the A's, it has the G's, it has the T's. It's wonderful. Um, when I'm working in Canva, they don't have Lexendeca yet. They have this one called League Spartan that's, that's close uh, that I, I use when I have to. But it, again, has the, has the A's, the G's, and the T's that the kids are literally learning how to write. Uh, the other um, letters, like the other A is telling them, no, the one you just learned is not the A. It's this A. There's so many varieties. Like there's all these choices when really they just want to read the one that they just learned. They know how to read it. And we should support that. Well, and I do remember a student like thinking they were going to correct me because I had I had used one of those A's and the G's and the T's and, and one of my signs and I, of course, fixed it. But they're like, Mrs. Herman, you spelled this wrong. And I was like, Oh, that's cute. Um, that's that's just another way to write an A. Oh, but Mrs. Harmon, that's not. I was like, oh, and really, they were quite sure that I didn't know how to spell. And they're right, I don't know how to spell. But in this case, it was just the the font that I had chosen was a bad choice. <laughs> oh my goodness, it looks so wrong to them. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. You know, and and friends, they will tell you when they think you're wrong. <laughs> 
every time, every time. They'll tell you when you move something in the space. They'll tell you when you um, did a different order of things during the day. I'm sorry, we do we do this next. We don't do this other thing. They will let you know. Yes, and for gosh sakes, if you don't know who the star student is, they're going to make sure you know who the star student of the day is. And sometimes I would just start by asking, friends, <laughs> where is my line leader? All right, who is my caboose today? And and do I have a star student? And then they say, Mrs. Herman, it's my job to pass out the papers. Well, get up here and pass out the papers. And Mrs. Herman, it's my job to pass out the pencils. Okay, come on. Let's go. <laughs> and they think it, it, they think they're doing their job. It's, it's adorable. And I've tried to keep track of it, but it's better to just kind of ask. Just, you know, I'm a star student. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about location, location, location. Um, everything has to be at eye level. And by the way, they're little. <laughs> yes, yes. I will often just like sit on one of our kick steps and, and look around the library and see what things are in my eyesight, like what's in my what's on my eye level and what's not. You can have signs other places because you have other kids in that space. Just remember your primary students when you're putting those signs up too. Think about uh, the height, the number, and then the placement. Are you put it in the back of the shelf? Is it in the front of the shelf? Is it on top? Is it to the side? Um, do you find that you need more than one for something big in the library? Uh, all of those considerations are good things to think about when you're adding signs for primary students. Well, and it it is a living space. I mean, when you yes. make when you when you make those decisions, you're like. My to-do list just gets longer because all of a sudden I realize, you know what? I and you can fix it on the spot, especially if you are are fine making your own signs. I was always fine making my own signs. Um, I was fortunate to work in a space that had a hard laminator, uh, which which really the hard laminator was worth it because I could make my own signs in the shelves and not have to buy any from Demco. They have great ones that you can buy, of course, but. Um, you know, I, my other favorite was to upcycle sets of encyclopedias with, I uh, use those as dividers um, for, oh, oh yeah, I learned this lesson from one of my assistants and you take a, the public library, you know, goes through a lot of, uh, print encyclopedias and they would hand us the ones that were, uh, you know, that were being, um, uh, replaced and you take a roll of bright neon duct tape. And, and tape that spine and then go to Joanne Fabrics or go get those those two and a half inch letters, uh, letters of the alphabet and make those as dividers for your your um, uh, everybody readers and for your fiction. And all of a sudden for four dollars, I could transform a set of encyclopedias into the dividers that I used in my fiction and my e-readers. Look at that upcycling. That's fantastic. I love that. I, I you know what? And I, I can post a picture on social. It was, it honestly is one of the most fun things you can do, especially because I realize like many people that there really isn't a need for a whole lot of reference books anymore. If we can rely on our, our uh, databases, we can rely on, uh, you know, those kinds of digital resources, all of a sudden, we're not going to need uh, print resources that take up a great deal of space and, and are collecting dust more than anything else. Shifting gears, when we talk about sound, let's talk about the kinds of things that our students are going to, to hear and, and how they engage. In this case, it would be we would talk about like the lessons that you are creating for your students. And, and you have a whole episode called Storytime Strategies, link in the show notes, friends, about how we are customizing those lessons, those, those best practices. But can you sort of give us some of those, those strategies sort of uh, right now? Sure. I put lessons in this section because I really think this is the time in your primary students' library experience when they're hearing you, the teacher, talk the most. So you really have to be thinking about the words that you're using during that lesson. Um, structure, 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 structure is so incredibly important to our primary friends. They want to know, like we've said, what's coming. They want to be able to participate because they they know that this thing is upcoming. Um, so perhaps, like I, 
I love to start with sign language. It gets everybody moving, everybody participating. We're interacting with words and letters in a different way. Um, so if kids know that's coming first, like, hey, I know I'm going to sit down. We're going to I'm going to move my hands, going to warm them up. Um, I also really think about the books that I'm using in my lessons being diverse from moment one. I am not waiting until they get to the end of first grade to to think about that. I am I am looking at that. I'm looking at the lessons that uh, the books that I use in my lessons from the moment they start kindergarten, uh, the second that they're in our school, making sure that they're hearing a lot of different voices. It's not just um, one type of author that they're hearing from. And I, when we're talking about their sound, it's really important to give them opportunities to verbally respond, whether that is a book that you are reading with some kind of choral response. I really like using those at the beginning of the school year, especially so that they can participate, they can say something. Or perhaps there's a rhyme coming up and it's very, very obvious. There's a picture to support it. You can let students respond that way or really just having a question to ask them right after the story is over. We want them responding. And it can be something as, as simple as, hey, we read this book about this boy that has an elephant as a pet. Like, if you could have a wild animal for a pet, what what animal would you have? And I really like to give them the opportunity to talk to their neighbors first so everyone gets to talk right away. We're not just raising hands and one or two students get to talk when we initially set that question out. Well, I know we, we used to talk about like shoulder partners, you know, do you have a shoulder partner you can talk to? I used a spinner because at one point somebody who had been observing me noticed that I was only picking on, you know, I, I think at this point I was picking on kids in the back row or, you know, I was trying to pick on the kids who might be furthest away from me so I could bring them into the conversation and... I wanted to make sure that all the students were feeling included. So yeah, I was using like a randomizer, like the letters that, that they were sitting on. I was like using an alphabet spinner so that I could make sure to, to call on lots of different kids. But no, I, I appreciate that because you, they want to share. They absolutely want to share. And you have to make sure that if they don't all get a chance to chime in, that they have a chance to share with their neighbors, their shoulder partners. Um, you know, I love that uh, you have included technology. I think so often we rule out the possibility of making technology as available to our youngest patrons because they're little. And, and that's absolutely the, the wrong thing to do. I think that they are absolutely fantastically capable of engaging with, with our technology. We just have to make sure that we customize it to this particular group and do so in a way that they feel empowered. Yes, absolutely. Uh, primary students are so very capable and they want to be able to do these things for themselves. I think it's, it's valuable many times to just take a leap, like get a little uncomfortable, what, like one more thing than you think they can do. Like just try. A lot of your students will jump right in and be fine and you can help the couple that won't. Um, I am a gigantic, gigantic fan of QR codes for our littles. I just think it is a wonderfully accessible thing that they can scan on an iPad or a Chromebook or a laptop or whatever device they might have. It's, it, and if you post them in the same place all the time, um, I have these tags that have the QR code and a picture representing the website or the um, the place I want them to go. Um, and they are posted in the same place every single lesson. So kids know like, I need a QR code. It's going to be right here every time. We have these little Velcro stickers on the back so they can go up. So when I think about using technology with, with our primary students, I start with the end goal of what I would like them to do in mind and then think about how I can break that down into little tiny pieces. You don't want to take a tech tool and throw it at the kids and introduce them to every single tool within that technology. They need one, one thing to do. And and perhaps next week, if if you're feeling good, if they're feeling like they have that master, you add another piece to that and you add another piece to that when they're ready. And then by the end, they can use these four different things to make something bigger than obviously they were able to at the beginning. If we give them those, if we give them those, those small pieces, they can achieve that. It, it feels great to them when they can be successful with that. That's amazing. So can you, can you give us a specific, you know, example in which you have broken down these steps, you know, and introduced them gradually? I would love to. We uh, do a school-wide humor award and every grade participates in this. It gives us a great uh, whole school shared experience, which I love facilitating. So at the end of this, I want our primary students to be able to produce a video vote on Seesaw that has the book cover next to them. So first week, we just are introduced to the video tool. They, they 
practice turning that camera around because man if that isn't the hardest thing in the world and and recording themselves like being heard not touching the microphone and, and making their hands make all this sound then the next week we add uh, a shape i ask them what their favorite shape is that's what their vi- whole video is going to be about and then they use a, a, a different tool to add the shape to their picture so they have their video and a shape the third week uh, I ask them what their favorite season is. And I put up four pictures representing the four seasons. Now they're practicing deleting pictures. I want them to take away the three that aren't what they want. That way they have their their picture uh, of their season and they have their video next to it. Then finally, that fourth time we're in there, they um, are presented with the eight books that we've read in the competition. They take away the seven they don't want. They change the background color. They're adding shapes. They're making their video. And they have this great product that their their classmates can watch. They can scroll through the other ones once they're finished. Oh, now forgive me, but where do you put them? So you put them in Seesaw so that the students can see the other things their classmates have done. I do. I do make it teacher approved. So once I approve them, then they can do that. But I, I try to be really fast about that and have my iPad out and approving them so they can see them in the moment. But it does make them authentic because anytime students know that they're creating things that their peers are going to see, uh, you know, I think it it makes it enhances the experience because they want to impress their peers. They really do. They care. They care about those things that are going to go out to you. This is everybody in the whole kindergarten class can see this. So make sure to do your best. And they, re- they do. It's great to see. I with, love it. Yes. With their tech, I also think about um, accessibility. Uh, when I started at my new school, the front page of our destiny was just text and links. And my older students got frustrated and said, Mrs. Okoye, I'm trying to click this link and I can't. It just keeps going to the wrong one. I was like, you're not wrong. This is not not accessible for you, let alone our younger students. So I changed it to, to a symbol that has these much bigger tiles that little fingers can touch. You really want to think about what those little fingers can and can't access when you are designing something that you're going to ask them to interact with. Well, and that Symbaloo, you're right, is fantastic because it, it almost resembles like, it looks like the interface on a, on a, on a smartphone. <laughs> exactly, it does. It looks like little apps. I never thought about that, but it, yeah. it totally does. They're, yeah, they're there familiar with it. See, absolutely. And again, you know, until it, you see it the way they do, like, like, oh, this makes complete sense. Now I get it. <laughs> Let's talk about common language, because I think that there are certain things that make sense to students, and you want to make sure that you're using terminology that's appropriate. I know because I was well, I, I, there was a time I was new to being an elementary librarian that I would try to echo or, uh, you know, use the the same phrases and terminology that they were hearing in the classroom. So if I happened to hear them when I was walking by their classroom teachers, trying to echo that so they they heard that continuity of, of language. I remember asking a teacher if I could sit in. I was struggling with second grade. Second, I'm not sure why, but I, the second grade seemed to be like difficult for me to really figure out. Watching that sort of role modeling, I wanted to learn how to do this better. Sometimes I'd find an excuse to go into their rooms just so I could sort of see how their rooms are laid out and what kinds of things they've done to make sure that they're supporting because they work with the, the, that age group all day long. So take some, tr- some of those pro tips from, from those teachers. Absolutely. That, uh, collaboration with your primary teachers is positively invaluable. The best thing I ever, ever did for my primary teaching was observe some kindergarten and first grade teachers. And it was not by choice. We had to, the specialists had to go into the classrooms at the beginning of each day for the social emotional curriculum with the goal of common language. And I was dragging my feet like, I have things to do. I have things to prepare for. I have books to show. And oh my God goodness, the things that I saw those teachers do, the way that they transition, the way that they reinforce students, the way that they redirect and talk to students was just mind blowing and changed my teaching for the better. I loved it. Well, and again, you know, you want to you want to help them feel successful and not to struggle. I remember one of my one of my uh, fellow librarians had a word wall 
And in much in much the same way, so they had a library word wall. And in much the same way that their classroom had a word wall, because these were students who were learning how to read. And so they would have, and she had like a Humpty, du- Humpty Dumpty at the top of her little word wall. And each word was a new brick on the wall. And it was, it was very cool. But, you know, it was very sweet. But she was introducing library terminology in a way that was part of the the visit every time they came in they were going to learn a new word but again keeping this very manageable and not trying to do this all in one go (laughs) so when we're referring to the different parts of our library with primary students you want to think ahead of time of the the words you're going to use to describe the different places in the library the words that you're going to use to describe the different processes that you are asking the kids to do the procedures that you're asking the kids to do um when you think about words that you're choosing, you want to connect to their existing schema whenever possible using words that they know. Simple terms are going to help everyone. Now, there are some library specific words that you want to teach. You probably want them to know what checkout is. Um, I got rid of the label of circulation circulation desk because I don't have five-year-olds that walk in and know what circulation is. Now, that's it's an adequate term. Like, it describes what's going on there. But now for a five-year-old, that, that word circulation is really big and doesn't really help them too much. But if they know, this is the place where I go to check out. This is the checkout desk. I go to the checkout desk to check out my book. And if I, as the teacher, consistently use that language that is so helpful to them. As somebody who has perfected this art of teaching uh, littles in the library, what has been your best approach when it comes to running a successful checkout? So I try very hard to think about the exact steps that I want kids to take ahead of time so that I, as the teacher, am not uh, thinking on the fly about what they're going to do. Okay, I know these kids are going to go here. These kids are going to do this. Um, You really want to think about, are you going to have everybody check out at once? Are you going to have them check out in groups? And I'll tell you, I'm never going back from having students check out in groups. I think it is the best thing since sliced bread. If you have everyone check out at once, you will be overwhelmed with the number of questions about where is this book? Where is this book? Things that you want to be able to answer. But if there are 18 kids asking you at the same time, that's just impossible. If your classes are uh, blessed to be that small, mine are more like 22 kindergartners right now. But uh, I linked in my presentation, I started checking out with center rotations. So we'd have um, some kind of tactile like building center. The other one would be at their tables, usually either paper-based or iPad-based. And then the other center, they're checking out and they rotate between those three um, each end of their library time. It worked great. I also, it's also really important that you don't just introduce that process once. It has got to be repeated, explicit instruction and modeling each time they come to the library until you think they can do it. And it's probably going to be longer than you want to do it. It's probably going to feel like forever that you have to keep doing the same thing, but they need it. They only come to you once a week. You do this every day. Like you have to keep doing it for them. And then make sure that you have signs up to support the things that you're saying. Uh, If you have some steps you want them to follow at the checkout desk, make sure you have those there with visuals and words so they can be supportive in that way. I I love that. And, you know, friends, at the end of the day, you know, don't be afraid to switch things up when you realize whatever it is you're doing is not being uh, as successful as you would hope. Um, You know, not be, don't be afraid. And nobody's going to sit there and hold you accountable and say, hey, you know, you can't, you can't change this because this is how we started to do this. I, you know, and I, I think that we have to make sure that we are always open to the idea that there's a better way. I remember leaning on my teachers a lot for this next component because the teachers had a far better sense of what the students were capable of when it came to reading. And because you're supporting older students, you're going to have chapter books in your collection, but you also have four-year-olds and five-year-olds. And so would you give us an idea of how did you sort of grapple with this idea of what kind of choice are you offering to your students without feeling too restrictive? Sure. I, again, think about this before kids ever come in. What sections am I going to tell kindergarten, first grade that they can check out from this first week? What uh, what parameters am I going to give them? 
um, thinking about when that's going to expand because they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you what the timeline is, like, when can I check out from this section? When can I check out from this section? And I am of the camp, if I have a kid that is dead set on getting a chapter book and they're five years old, if it is the difference between them getting a book and not getting a book, I'll let them take it. Like, you need to have a positive library experience. We will try again next time. We will we will try to get you into something that probably has more pictures and can support you more. Um, even if I'm giving them that parameter, I'm still okay with letting that chapter book walk out the door. It's fine. I used to struggle because a teacher's would, you know, sometimes they, I would get the message from the teacher and it says, look, you know, the parent doesn't want the kid bringing home a chapter book because the parent wants the kid to read the book, not the parent read the book to the child. And, and this sounds, so you're having this conversation, you're, I'm feeling really conflicted I, if I'm, if I'm going to be completely honest, because you've got a student who wants to read a chapter book, but what is happening at home is this is becomes the parent is reading the book to the child and the child is listening and that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, you also want to encourage the students to become more confident in their reading skills. Absolutely. And that that comes down to a lot of personal conversations. And if you have that idea of having so many books up and out, those kids are going to see different books every single time they come to the library. And you will have a different set of books that you can say, oh, my gosh, you see, we just got this book in that's on lizards. And we have this amazing book over here on this subject. Did you know we have monster trucks in this library? Like it exists. We really have it. We have unicorns. Did you know that? Just introducing that that kid to more and more and more every time until you start to get them hooked. I'm like, oh, my gosh, when I can pick up this book and I can read some of the words. Whoa, whoa. OK. All right. We're going with this now. Well, and you're right because I I had some students who was it was very it was interesting because I every once in a while you get an email from a parent that says, "Listen, my kid checks out dinosaur books every single week. Can we please please try something else?" <laughs> and, you know, on the one hand, you're like, "Look, you've got this kid; they're going through a phase." But you know, well, and it's hard because you as the as the librarian have seen that so many times and you know it. You know that's a phase that you know that they're going to be on to robots the next week. But it is it is hard to communicate that sometimes to parents like it, you need to like encourage this reading. They're reading. They're checking out books. They're interacting with text like we're going to keep this train going. Well, and I'm sure you've seen this, too, because our students feel I mean, their knowledge is their currency. Their knowledge is their power. And they when they feel confident about a topic it's what they want to talk about. And it's and they want to own that that knowledge and be able to share it and impress the, the the adults around them. And they do that by digging deep into those topics. And I, you know, like, I'm sure you can, you know, sort of, we are a mile wide and an inch deep, but boy, when it comes to certain things, we're going to own every single book on that topic. And, I, you know, when I, I think about like breeds of cats and dogs, my goodness, we had every single breed of cat and every single breed of dogs. And, but again, you, you wanted to have as, as wide and broad a collection as you could possibly get. Absolutely. And when you have kids asking for cat books every week, you want to support that and have a variety of books on that, on that very high interest topic for your students. You want to really flesh that section out. And I think that it might bother some librarians too because it starts to feel like your nonfiction uh, is unbalanced, but it is, it's not. It's serving the population that is at your school and, and their interests. I love what you said earlier about the library being a living organism. Like it's going gonna, it's gonna to move, it's going to shift. Um, topics of interest are going to wane and wax and they're going to change. And it's your job as a librarian to keep tabs on that and adjust your collection to follow the kid. I want to make sure that we talk about the programs that you're offering that you feel have been really successful in supporting your youngest patrons. Sure. The last time I made a reading challenge, I, I was thinking and thinking about how to roll this out so our primary students could could be supported in it too. Um, we did a we tried a forty book challenge. I mean, twenty books in the fall, twenty books in the spring, and um, I had trackers for kindergarten, first and second grade, as well as our, our third, fourth and fifth grade students. Um, now, they did require um, the title to be written and uh, the kid to give a rating of one through five stars, which did require uh, either some some grown up support 
or if I had a kid that was afraid they were going to lose it or they didn't think they would uh, get that support at home, uh, we had library folders and they would leave their tracker at school and I would do my very best or have another adult in the room do the rest to, to help help them write those out. I'm not going to lie to you and say that like it was perfect and um, we got every single kid that wanted to do it. it. It was executed perfectly, but it got a lot of kids involved. We had a lot of kids jump on it and, and read a bunch of different types of books that they wouldn't have, which was one of the goals. And it, it works pretty well for that. Just just trying, just throw throw the balls out and try sometimes um, to get your younger students involved in a reading challenge because they want to be part of it. I know that students look forward to uh, certain things that we schedule during the year. The bookmark contest is one that I always am a little concerned about because invariably there are going to be some hurt feelings. There absolutely are. There are going to be kids that are just crushed that theirs wasn't chosen. And I, I try to hand over as much as I can to the kids in our bookmark contest. We The kids design them. I load them in Google form and the kids vote. It's it's kid vote. And I don't attach names so that it doesn't become a popularity contest. I mean, kids can still say, obviously, like, number 17 is mine in their class, which they do. And that's that's going to happen no matter what. But when we put up the winners, I also keep those anonymous so that we don't know who like okay like again you can claim it in your class like oh it must be somebody from the other first grade class that won that one now when we print them and put them out for people to color that's when we attach the names and then they can see like hey this is avery's bookmark excellent i'm so excited to get to color Avery's. see that's that way you can i love that you can let the kid decide how much how much they want to say of like i put my heart and soul into this and i didn't get it they don't have they can say that if they want to and get some support and they can they can not say it if they don't want to we're, we're trying. I, I love that you found an elegant solution that still allows students to feel celebrated. Let's talk about student voice in your space because they all want, they all have ideas of what they want. And, and I love that you've given them opportunities to express that in your space. I really try to give them all the opportunities I can to take ownership and really feel like they belong in our space, their voice counts, even if they're six years old, that their voice counts in our space. So uh, thinking of a way that you can allow those kids to make book recommendations. Maybe there is a special shelf that that when a kid like turns their book in, they can say like, hey, I want this to go on the kindergarten recommend shelf. Or there's a special bookmark that they can put in that goes to the display like, hey, this is a kindergarten recommended book. Um, again, with our, our Shewer contest, we had... Um, a naming rights, like, an, I, I won't say battle, but we let everybody participate in th- and throw names in. And we voted on the names. And a second grade girl, uh, she named it the Flamingo Funny Competition and everybody loved it. And oh my goodness, it was the best thing in the world when we announced it in her class. Like she was not only excited, but her friends around her were just thrilled. Like, oh my gosh, like, Allie, you got to name the contest. It's It's a really big thing when they know that their voice is celebrated in that way. In that same contest, when we vote, uh, I, I, tr- I do my best to make it visual. It, it doesn't say the kid's name, but we take uh, colored dots and each colored dot is a different grade level. So that when the kids vote on the display in the hallway, you can very easily see like, hey, kindergarten like this book the best, second grade like this book the best. They can see the colors and know like who, what grade liked the book. And that way they can see like, hey, kindergarten like a different book from fifth grade. That's right. Because we're kindergarten. We like this book. And then finding places and ways that you can display student work and really thinking of opportunities to display your kindergarten first, second grade work. Don't just reserve that for your fourth, fifth, and third graders. Think about ways that um, you can either talk to your art teacher or their classroom teachers or a, a, an art project that you might do in the library, getting those things up so they have ownership in that space again. Well, and it, it really does. I mean, the, it, this is a it's a place where we can showcase our students <laughs> And in a way that, you know, let's remember that our libraries are also being used for those those PTO meetings. Those are those are where the the, our community organizations, when we have a community uh, meeting, it's oftentimes held. Oh, no, it's always held. It's always held. Always. Always Always. held. Anytime we've got a nighttime (laughs) meeting, uh, it is always held in our learning commons, in our library. And so this is the the obvious space where we can, you know, showcase our students work. And I have noticed also uh, many of our libraries are blessed with this abundance of windows. And so we can use those. I I actually have a a room called the fishbowl 
because it's nothing but windows. <laughs> and, you know, it's not hard to to put student art up because it's just going up on the glass and it's not like it's going to take anybody's paint off. You don't have to worry about thumbtacks or stapling anything. You don't have a, a display. You know, you really can just use that the, that those windows as frames for the students' work. I love to know this, this pro tip here. Um, you've got a would you rather section. And could you just explain that for listeners? Because I know what you're doing, but I want to make sure that for the benefit of our listeners, when you talk about a would you rather and getting that student voice. Can you explain what what you're doing? Sure, it's a really good way to allow students to to voice their opinion and you keep it really simple. There's just two little quick um, options that they could do. You could have them stand up and sit down. You can have them give thumbs up and thumbs down. You can have them shape their bodies a different way if you need them to be up and moving, but just giving them another way to, to interact and move in the library and express their opinion. This is a fantastic suggestion, and and I love this if you explain it. When a question arises repeatedly, it's time to take action. So that makes sense, but give us an ex- an example of how this works in your space. So the great thing about primary students is they will ask you that same question over and over and over and over again, and that that's your clue. That's your clue. This is something that needs to be clarified. So there are several ways you can kind of go about doing this. If perhaps it's something that you can, maybe you turn that answer into a lesson. If if you're getting a lot of questions early in the year, like where are the books with real pictures? And you're like, well, I didn't have fiction, nonfiction scheduled till, you know, October. Move that lesson up. Like move it up. Your kids want to know the answer to that question. So let's move it up in the lesson. Um, you could also add new signage. If um, you're constantly getting the question, like where are the princess books? Maybe you need a sign by where the princess books are. Or if you're like me, I did not have those all in the same place. And we got the question over. We got it so many times. I was like, obviously, I need to pull my princess books and have them in one place so that uh, Mrs. McCoy can point you over here so that the kids know these are where the princess books are. And if you have a process that they're going to do, you might create some kind of printed guide that with the steps, again, supporting with words and in visuals. I, I definitely have this up at our checkout desk so that kids can see... I, what do I scan first again? They can look at the guide. It's right there for them. Excellent. So, you know, and I love that you've also resorted to making little tutorials that the students can watch. I love this for a variety of reasons. I would get the same question over and over again, like the one that we talked about earlier. Can I check out those books on display? This is quick. Can I check that book out? Can I check that book out? I feel like I've answered this 18 times. I, I need to do something different. Why don't I make a video for this? So I've done this for, for questions like that, for procedures, things that, that need kind of that repetition and that reinforcement. And I really love how they can be tailored to the frequently asked questions in your library. You can, you can be very specific on this question is coming up in our space. Uh, it allows your kids to repeatedly view them if you are comfortable putting them on something like YouTube. I know that my kids are on YouTube and I have kids saying, Mrs. McCoy, I, I liked and subscribed and I showed my parents. Which means they're watching it, which means they're learning how to how to do our li- like do library, which is great. And then if you choose to show them in class, which I absolutely do, so that everybody gets exposure to them, everyone sees them, it gives you a second to a take a breath, help that teacher that's been waiting on you for two minutes, and help the fifth grade student that came in and can't find book five in the series they were hoping to find. It gives you a second to take care of those, and then get back to your students too. I love it. That's fantastic. You know, Amanda McCoy, you have, you know, you celebrate these littles in your space every single day. And, you know, I know that I know I have been able to benefit from all of this. I'm hoping that our our listeners have have appreciated all the work that you put into this amazing presentation. And and even if they couldn't come and see you present in live, we all had a chance to be able to to see some of this and and dig into this. Would you let us know how our listening audience can uh, be a part of your PLN and and in, and follow you on social media? Absolutely. I am on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Blue Sky at Illini McCoy. That's I-L-L-I-N-I-M-C-C-O-Y. Proud graduate of the University of Illinois. Uh, I also have a website called AhoyMrsMcCoy.com. I found I was posting so many things on social media that I wanted to share. I just thought I'd have a place to like house them. And then my YouTube channel where I post those videos is also Ahoy Mrs. McCoy. 
I love it. I love it. I'm so grateful for all that you've shared with us today. And I know that listeners are going to take what you have taught us and and started, you know, implementing some of those changes in our spaces today. I hope that you have a fantastic rest of the 2023 year. We're, we're coming, we're wrapping it up uh, very quickly. And, and I look forward to our paths crossing in the future. That sounds amazing, Amy. I can't wait. Thanks. Have a great night. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider following Amanda on her social media and leaving her some fan mail. One last friendly reminder, use the code UNITED to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more and librarians who book their very first literati book fair for this school year and mention the code UNITED when booking may qualify to receive a $500 gift card to Tidal Wave. Visit the link in today's show notes and call the literati team to see if you qualify. The topic of our next episode will be Black Girl Magic and my conversation with Lanair Miller and Lauren Mobley. I hope you will tune in.